My name is Diane Martin, you've met me already, and I am the director of the G-Gear program. And I want to talk to you about strategies to improve communication uh, related to health literacy, but then communication in general with older adults living with a dementia. And a lot of these tips are obviously also very good for older adults in general, as well as the general population, any of us. This is how we want to be able to communicate with other people. So I have no conflicts. And my objectives are that you will understand the key concepts or be able to define the key concepts of effective communication, that you will understand the implications of poor communication on interactions, health outcomes, as well as the increase in medical costs that come with not being, as Taka had mentioned, um, you know, the, the increased cost of not understanding medical information, maybe not following doctor's recommendations because you don't understand it, and then to be able to apply some of the strategies that you're learning today, some of these techniques, to increase clear communication and understanding with families, the caregivers, as well as uh, persons who are living with a dementia. Remind me, we're primarily professionals in this room? Perfect, okay, thank you. All right, so just to revisit what Taka had to discuss with you this morning, it's a two-way street when we think about health literacy. Healthy People 2030, the new guidelines, um, say that it's not just our responsibility as the patient or the caregiver of the patient, it is also our provider's responsibility to make sure that we understand that information. So it's a patient's and caregiver's ability to obtain the information, to understand the information, and to act on that information. And it's our provider's capacity or ability to clearly communicate the information to us. What are we supposed to be doing? Medication, what is it for? When do we take it? Twice a day, what does that mean, right? Or we'll see on the script, oftentimes we'll see BID, which is shorthand for twice a day, but twice a day, does that mean I have to take it at noon and then wake up at midnight to take it? Is it okay for me to take it at eight o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon? I was talking with someone recently who says, yeah, I take my medicine twice a day. I don't know when I'm supposed to take it. So I just take both the tablets at the same time so I know I've taken them, right? So it is the providers, uh, not just our, our medical provider, our pharmacist, our nurse, right? Whoever, the care manager, the navigator who we may be working with to make sure we understand the health information that we need so that we can stay out of the emergency department, for example. Take a minute to read this. Oftentimes, this is what receiving information from a doctor's office is like. Now imagine being someone who's living with a dementia or an older family member who's providing care to that person, right? So yeah, if you read it backwards, it's um, the first line would be to assure high performance, periodically clean the tape heads, right? Yeah. And <laughs> there you go, you can keep on going. But how did that make you feel? But just stop trying. You stop trying, yeah. When I saw it before I figured out that it was backwards, I'm like, I'm not reading. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Before you figured out that it was the, uh, written backwards, each word written backwards, did you know what to do? Grab a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. How many of you have participated in the Dementia Live training? Anybody in here? Okay. Yeah, why don't you tell us, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? So the, the Dementia Live, uh, why don't you tell a little bit what it was and then what the experience was like? So it, it was a training where um, you have, basically it's, it's kind of like sensory deprivation uh, or manipulation in certain senses. Um, and it is sort of intended to mimic what people with memory loss and dementia may be experiencing. And, Personally, I, I did it with a group of, of my staff and a couple of board members, um, and it really was terribly disorienting. Yeah. Uh, and, and 
very frustrating and actually even a little bit uh, frightening. Yeah, yeah, but that's what life is like as best as we can mimic it. And we are going to have, if you're coming to the May 10th event, we are going to do the, the Dementia Live um, trainings then. The two trainers that we have locally weren't available that I normally work with, so we weren't able to get them for today, but they will be here if you're back here for May 10th. But basically, you're put in a room and you're uh, given glasses that alter your vision, you're given headphones that have noises coming in, train sounds, children talking or crying. You have TV sounds and you're putting, you put on gloves. Um, so you put on plastic gloves and then you put on like oversized gloves over the top. So it, it mimics some uh, tactile uh, dysfunction and mimics auditory confusion and um, visual. Uh, uh, confusion as well. And now with all that gear and your headphones turned up, I'm going to come up to you and say, I want you to count out 13 cents. I want you to uh, fold the blue shirt and hang, uh, hang up the white shirt. And I want you to put the silverware away. Right? So how many of you have done Dementia Live? What was that like when you when you were given those directions? Very, you couldn't hear, you couldn't understand. It was dark. It was it was very frustrating. And by the time I left there, I was shook. Yeah. I just and it gives you so much more perspective. There is a YouTube video. It's um, 12 minutes with Alzheimer's and dementia with Dateline, I believe. Oh, okay. And I show that to my staff for education. And it's, it's very riveting as well. Yeah, well, if you ever want to do the Dementia Live, we're trainers. Um, I obviously can't do two things at once, but I'm also a, a trainer, and there's no cost. So we can come into your, your organization and do the Dementia Live training um, for you at no cost. Um, but just as, as we've now had two people tell us, it is, it's, it's frightening. The experience of, okay, wait, I didn't quite understand. And your peers, when you went through it, those of you who went through it, did you see some of your peers just shut down or perhaps yourself just shut down and, and sit and wait for the process to be over? You probably saw others that just kind of followed someone else. They kind of tagged on to someone and just did whatever they were doing. You saw people perhaps getting frustrated when I've done the training. I've actually had people throw down the hangers and the shirts before. Right, because they couldn't button, button those items and it was getting very, very aggravating for them. Is that what we see when we're working with individuals? Absolutely. So the exact same thing as best we can try to mimic the experience is what that Dementia Live training is for. But that's what it's like when you're trying to understand medical information. It's a lot of jargon that doesn't make much sense to us. Right? It's also overwhelming oftentimes to be in that doctor's office and having all of those tests. I, I, my initial out of um, undergrad, I worked at the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for about 10 years. And one of my positions there was to do the neuropsychological assessments. So imagine being in a room with me. I'm you know, 24, 25 years old. I'm wearing my white coat. And you are an 80-year-old person sitting in front of me. And I'm saying, what is today? Where are we right now? What is this thing when I have my wristwatch on? What is this called? And now I'm going to show you a series of uh, pictures. What is this a picture of? What is that a picture of? Now I'm going to give you a minute to tell me all the things that start with the letter S, right? Or all the things you can find in a grocery store, right? That's part of a neuropsychological assessment for uh, dementia. Three hours without a break, right? Can you imagine how I've had people spit on me, right? I've had people throw things at me. Um, so yeah, it, it's very overwhelming when you're, you're having that diagnosis, when you're undergoing these tests. It's frustrating. You oftentimes don't know what to do. We do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned to duck. <laughs> so who is most at risk for poor literacy? It's older adults in general. It's, as we discussed in the other room, it's the ethnic and racial minorities. It's individuals who have limited education. Right? We talked about in the other room with Taka how material oftentimes is written for an eighth or a tenth grade education level. Our doctors are speaking to us at that higher level. But if we have limited education, a second, a lot of patients that I worked with at the ADRC, they you know, had to leave school, second grade, third grade. 
I mean, this is 40 years ago, so you know, they, these were individuals because of the war, because of, of death in the family during the um, Depression, had to quit school and take care of things on the farm. So limited education, immigrants don't necessarily have great education systems that they're coming, and now they're coming into our healthcare system, and we're talking with them as if they've been here and have the same education levels as our physicians and our nurses. Low socioeconomic status, as well as individuals who are living with chronic diseases like an Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia. Yeah. And I work at the Department of Social Services, so our clients are multiple. Yeah. I and mean, they're older adults with limited education, low socioeconomic and, and chronic diseases, so they have them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Triple, triple, oftentimes quadruple boxes they're checking. Yeah. Have, have you seen an increase of younger adults, but they have kind of like lonely people? burn their brains because of substance use? Mm. I personally... Should, should, should that be like a group? That, yeah, substance use. Um, I haven't checked into the literature on that, but absolutely. And even, you know, TBI. You know, individuals who've had TBI. Yeah, yeah. Because I work for the, you know, for the Veterans Affairs, but we have a lot of young guys. Yeah. Um, and those of you who attended webinar one, I shared with you some recent research that just came out this year on social isolation in young people, and we're seeing an increase in cognitive impairment in these young individuals, especially those who, who were in school when they're supposed to be out there socializing with their peers in college or in high school, and they're saying that's going to increase the risk of, of dementia as they grow uh, into later life. Autistic as well. What's that? Autistic. Autistic, program. yeah. Yeah. Um, so why are there risks? Because oftentimes there's that reliance in medical communication on the written word, right? So the doctor only has about seven minutes to spend with us, and then we're getting out all these papers. We talked about that in the other room. So there's such a reliance on the instructions that we get sent home with that doesn't break it down. And that stressful environment of being in the doctor's office, any explanation that's happening there, oftentimes is going over our heads. Our medical system, our healthcare system in general, is very complex, right? No longer do we have the, the doctor that you go into um, you know, his clinic and everything is right there. Now you're being sent for these tests over here and you're receiving these medications. And you know, the interactions with medications, oftentimes we're missing that kind of information as well, that polypharmacy. We're um, having a lot more tests and procedures being ordered, oftentimes to protect the physician to make sure that all those boxes are checked. There's a growing reliance on us being able to take care of ourselves, right? So we don't have visiting nurses that are coming into our homes to make sure that the medications are being done, that wound care is being done. But that's being left oftentimes to the family members or sometimes to the individuals themselves. So it's getting very complex. And then obviously the language that we're using oftentimes is not being understood. So effective communication is important, obviously. Um, it does reduce health care costs through decreased admissions, especially to the emergency department. Um, it does provide us with more focused care when we are speaking the language that not language like English or Spanish or whatever the language person is speaking, but speaking at the level that the individual can understand. Um, increase patient and caregiver satisfaction with care. So the likelihood if I'm able to ask questions, have opportunities for a discussion about my medical diagnosis, about the care that I need to provide, increases the likelihood that I'm going to be satisfied with that and return for the follow-up care that's so necessary. It increases, even individuals living with a dementia, it increases the likelihood that they're going to remain independent for a longer period of time, that they're going to be able to um, uh, uh, perform some of their self-care that's so necessary, which is so important in our society today as we have more and more adults, older adults, who are living independently, living independently with a dementia. I just hosted a summit last week on the live-alones. We call them the live-alones with dementia, right? It's a growing, I don't want to call it a problem, but it is a growing challenge in our society as um, you know, we have high divorce rates, we have high uh, family mobility, so to have someone close by that, that can meet the needs of older adults, it's really important that we are um, giving them the tools to be independent, to manage their self-care 
for as long as possible. Even individuals, Alzheimer's disease, dementia is not a death sentence, right? That's still a person. They're still capable of self-care for a pretty long time, right? When I was in, in the field 30 years ago, 35 years ago, it was about seven years from diagnosis to death. We've extended that to about 14 or 15 years. The idea that we can diagnose someone, but get them to end of life still functional is really what, what's happening with, with a lot of the technology that we have, the therapies that are available. But we need to make sure that people are understanding the instructions with those therapies, if they're doing OT, uh, occupational therapy, or physical therapy, that they're actually doing the exercises, that they're actually going through those routines so that they can keep up their physical, uh, reduce their physical limitations, increase their functional abilities. All right, um, another piece obviously that's important for effective communication is to establish relationships, right? When we have relationships, we see this in the literature, even for staff, having a relationship with the patient increases quality of life, not just for the patient, but for the staff member as well. Right, so they're, they're asking, you know, how's your family? How's Bill doing today? Getting to know that patient increases quality of life for both um, the, the providers as well as the, the patients and the caregivers. And it's a social connection, right? It doesn't matter if we're going to the doctor. I, I've seen a lot of older adults who go to the emergency department because that's their only social connection. They're isolated, especially individuals who are living in the more rural areas. They, you know, that EMT comes and takes them and they're talking. They're talking, I know someone who, um, she had low blood sugar, her, her daughter um, picked her up, but her daughter works full time, so the woman is, is 91, 92 years old, so she's home by herself all the time, and the daughter came home, and her mother was passed out and called the EMT. The, the EMT gave whatever fluids that she needed or whatever it was she needed, and then she's having a great time talking with the EMTs on the way there, and Sharon's like, wait, what? It's the quality of those connections. It's a relationship, even if it's in the emergency department, seeing those providers or the EMTs that are coming to take them. Uh, but there are barriers to effective communication. Low health literacy, as Dr. Yamashita was talking earlier, those of you who attended the first webinar that I delivered on uh, age-related sensory changes, we talked about how information, because of visual changes, because of auditory changes, may not actually make it even into our memory system to begin getting processed, let alone to be understood and used. Uh, last webinar with, with um, Dr. Majid, talking about the different types of dementia and how they impact. Each one has a different impact on how we understand um, health instructions. Um, so changes in the brain resulting in these progressive loss of ability for meaningful communication. Let me just give you an example. This is the video that we were hoping to show you, those of you who were at that March 8th webinar. What is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting one in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. 
Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination, and in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady, and takes place over an average of eight to ten years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org. I like to show it because it, it illustrates how communication, right? We're thinking mom still looks the same. Why is she reacting like this? Mom, snap out of it. Mom, I told you that six times already, right? But when you can understand the parts of the brain that are being affected by the disease process, it can help instill a little bit more patience and empathy with the individual, very similar to how that Dementia Live uh, programming um, can help. Um, so those are individual factors, things that we've talked about the last couple of weeks when we think about sensory changes, when we think about um, uh, dementia, when we think about these changes in the brain that are happening as the dementia progresses. But then there's also those environmental factors. The individuals who are living alone, so they lack opportunities for interaction. We know now that social isolation is a risk factor for dementia, for Alzheimer's disease. Ignoring talk. Right? Have you ever gone to the doctor's office with, with an older loved one or even for, on your own? And the doctor's talking to the, the nurse or to the younger family members who are there, completely leaving the person out of those conversations. Um, task talk, thinking about, okay, now I'm going to take your blood pressure. There's other things you can talk about other than saying, yes, you have to tell them what, what you're doing, but you don't have to be silent for the couple of minutes it takes to do the blood pressure or to do the blood draw. So more focused on the tasks that are being done rather than forming those relationships with the patient. And elder speak, what is elder speak? Have you had that, heard that term before? Is it a term? Elder speak? Have to speak that. Wow. No, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Adam was one of my, my students. Adam has a master's in gerontology. Do you remember what elder speak is? Yeah, it's kind of speaking to the stereotypes of older adults. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's... Talking to them, talking they down. remain... Demeaning. Yeah. Yeah. So elder speak we oftentimes associate with this top-down processing where we're paying attention to the cues of uh, the old age or of Alzheimer's disease. And that conjures up these stereotypes of someone who has Alzheimer's disease and wait, they don't understand, so I'm not even going to try to get them to, to um, interact with me. I was at a farm store at Easter time about four or five years ago. And this woman was with her, her father who clearly had some type of a dementia. And she is yelling at him as we're walking through the farm store. And this poor man was in tears. And it was at Easter, and I was wearing my, my uh, cross. And he pulled his cross out of, um, from underneath his shirt. And at that moment, we had a connection. right? But the way that she was treating him, he was so embarrassed. So even though he had a dementia, he was responding to how she was interacting with him. The stereotype, right? And yes, she has to live with him. And yes, you know, it can be for those of you who do have um, older family members. Uh, stress, 
right? But to berate someone in public like that ever, you know, we don't do that to a child. Why would we do that to a parent or any older person? Um, but the stress, the, the stereotypes, the stereotypes oftentimes that we have. And so they look for those connections. Um, but we do modify how we interact. We start, like you said, talking louder to someone. Well, do you know that someone is hard of hearing? Right? Simply because they have gray hair or because they have a dementia, does that mean they can no longer um, hear us at a regular tone? No. But we do modify our speech, and as a result, the person assumes those stereotypical behaviors that we expect. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that actually constrains opportunities for interactions. It lowers their self-esteem, increases risk of de uh, depression and social isolation, and we've seen more of those changes, those whether it's normal aging changes or a progression, a more rapid progression of that dementia, right? So elder speak is this bias in communication. It's an intergenerational speech style. You don't see a husband and wife talking to each other like this. But if you've gone into a, a, a skilled nursing or even oftentimes an assisted living, you'll see staff members talking to older adults like this. Um, baby talk, um, terms of endearment, instructions, okay dear, I'm going to, I want you to raise your arms up, we're gonna take off your shirt, give a little hop so that we can get you ready for bed, into bed. You don't talk to an adult like that. Right? You have to remember that these are adults, these are not children, these are people who had a life lived and deserve the respect of having their life lived, respected, and understood, getting to know the individual, that person-centered approach. Did you think it had to do with the fact that people think that their roles change? That's exactly what it is. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a term for it. I don't remember it off the top, top of my head, but... Yeah. yeah. Like, like, because I have been in the hospital when the children tell their parents, oh, I'm the one in charge now, and the veteran is like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, how do you be in charge? I don't know. I just wondering. Um, which is shorter statements as if the person can't understand a complex sentence, right? Without talking with that individual and seeing what they understand, even as the dementia, dementia is progressing. To, to just automatically assume that they can't hear you, that they can't understand you, if you use um, you know, the, the official name for something as opposed to uh, you know, um, use a car, use a car. What do I, I drive a, a Volvo. So you know, to, say, to, to say, oh, mom, let's go to my, you know, I just bought a new Volvo, mom. Mom, I just bought a new car, right? As if she's not going to understand what a Volvo is, maybe she doesn't. But do I need to assume that out of the box or do I start with the higher level and then adjust based on the cues that she's giving me if she's understanding it? Um, speaking too slowly, overly caring and controlling, right? I was, there's a commercial that runs, I live in Pennsylvania, there's a commercial that runs for a new uh, long-term care community that opened up. It's two sisters talking about making, taking a tour of this community and how nice it's going to be for mom. Where's mom? Right? Mom's not even part of the conversation. It's these two girls deciding mom needs to live in long-term care, therefore this is where we're going to place her. Right? So it's making decisions without even including the older person into that discussion. Um, so it is very common in our society, especially in these health and social care settings. And it's based on these stereotypes. To go back to this model, um, you know, we encounter someone, we recognize the cues of not only old age, but also that somebody perhaps is, is beginning to experience dementia. We conjure up the stereotypes, and then we begin to moder um, we begin to change how we interact with that person. We modify our speech based on that. Um, so it is intended to nurture and facilitate, but even someone with a dementia understands that this is not how you should be talking with me. Have you seen that? Resistiveness to care increases when we use elder speak. There's a huge body of research um, out there uh, out of Kansas. Um, there's a big researcher who's focused specifically on resistiveness to, resistiveness to care. And the more elder speak is used, the less likely they're going to be able to get that patient to do what they want them to do, whether it's, it's um, you know, taking a bath, getting dressed, or eating. 
Um, so the negative effects or potential negative effects, the older adult, regardless of their dementia, they do recognize as they're being talked down to, they recognize it as demeaning. Just as that man in the farm store, you know, they, they take on that, that sense of humiliation by the way that this adult child is talking. Um, so it does alter their self-concept, it decreases their self-esteem, leads to depression, leads to social isolation. And again, that idea that they're assuming those stereotypical behaviors, as well as that resistiveness to care. So how do we enhance communication? Bottom up, right? So we went top down is stereotyping. Bottom up, when we encounter the person and we recognize those cues on the individual, we have a conversation and we try to understand, do I need to talk louder? Do I need to simplify? Do I need to demonstrate what I want as I use those words? And we begin to modify our communication as opposed to using a stereotype. So it's that person-centered approach. We un understand the individual needs. We modify how we're interacting. We're doing constant individualized assessments. Is this person responding positively to me? What am I doing well that he's responding or she's responding well? What, what do I still need to change? And then that person feels empowered. Even someone with dementia is going to respond more positively to this, especially in the early to moderate stages. You know, as it really gets down into that personality center, we may not see the same type of response, but at least you know, for the first several years of the disease process, this works really well. It increases well-being, increases self-reliance, maximizes communication with others, so they want to seek out relationships. Um, and so increased satisfaction with family, increased satisfaction with providers. And when you're getting, as the provider, when you're getting the positive reaction from the patient, you're more likely to repeat that same cycle. It begins with the basics, right? So avoiding prejudice, um, we get to know the person, we begin conversations in social ways, just having a conversation. Rather than getting right into the nitty gritty of why we're here, having those social conversations. You know, how, how's your son today, right? Oh, I heard you, you know, you have got a wedding coming up. Tell me a little bit about the wedding planning. How's that going? Beginning in that very social way relaxes the individual and makes them more likely to open up. Um, speaking slowly, but in a natural town, thank you. Um, enunciating your words, right? And ladies, we have high-pitched voices. So as I'm trying to project my voice, I'm actually making it much high, higher, right? And when I make my voice higher, when we yell, it makes it more difficult for someone to be able to hear us, right? Guys, you've got the perfect, the perfect level, but the rest of us, not so much. Um, yeah. Yep. My dog went after my cat yesterday, and I just heard my pitch and my voice getting higher and higher as I was yelling at my dog. <laughs> um, when you aren't being understood, so oftentimes we want to blame the patient or the person living with the disease. Why aren't we looking at ourselves? What am I doing that could decrease the effectiveness of the communication. Am I talking too fast? I'm from New York, I talk fast. I, my dad was an older dad, and that was one thing he drilled into me is you need to slow down when you're talking. Um, can you illustrate? I want you to have a seat, right? Come, sit. So I'm saying the words, but I'm also demonstrating what it is I want you to do. Um, and if you're still not being understood, is there a simpler way of saying it? Um, if the person is getting upset, try changing the subject. You can always come back to it later. Don't be afraid to touch, right? Don't, we are in such a society that you're not supposed to touch anybody. Touching the back of the hand or a pat on the shoulder can be really comforting to, to individuals who are experiencing a dementia and really any older adult. But um, There is no group of patients out there in, more in need of supportive relationships than someone who's living with a dementia. Can you just imagine how frightening it must be, right? From diagnosis, and, oops, from diagnosis, watching yourself, right? And yes, some people, as that disease progresses, they don't remember that they have the dementia, but that initial, and so many physicians don't even want to give that diagnosis, and we'll talk later about why it's important that a diagnosis be made. Um, but Providers generally avoid communicating with these individuals. Um, they find the verbalizations that come back as confusing. 
Even care providers as, as that disease progresses feel like they're receiving very little feedback. All behavior is feedback, right? So if someone's becoming resistive to care, that's feedback, right? That's telling you, wait, you've got to slow down. There's something else happening here, right? Uh, let's see. So support that person, right? Um, uh, facilitate conversations, collaborate with the person, don't do things for them, um, but figure out where they are, what their needs are, and then, you know, maybe it's just, mom, can you fold these socks for me, right? Involve them so that there's still that social connection that can be made. And providers, I know we don't, well, yeah, these, you're all providers. Um, use plain language, right? Living room language. Why do we think we have to make ourselves seem so much smarter than everybody else in the room? That living room language, especially in working with caregivers, working with um, uh, patients that are, are living with a dementia, just that plain language is so important. Um, <laughs> Patient-friendly materials. I think Sharnese is covering this, but I, I just wanted to put that out for those of you who are creating materials for um, patients, for uh, residents in, in your nursing homes, or your skilled nursing homes, your assisted livings. Uh, there are, the National Institute of Aging has this great website on creating computer material website material, as well as printed material. So I just pu pulled out some of the key points here, you know, keeping out the medical jargon, um, clear headings, lots of white space. Uh, focus, what are the three main things, for example, that you want to be able to, to relay to that person? And what, what should they be doing? This is what Taka talked about. What, what should this person be doing, that checklist? Uh, remember, nonverbal communication, 70% of our communication is nonverbal. We need to make sure that the words that we're saying match our actions, right? So, must have something on here that's dancing by itself. Um, it does vary with culture. There are, are, you know, we also have to understand the culture that the person's coming in, and even though it might make us uncomfortable, we need to get out of our, our comfort zone and, and meet the person where he or she is at. Touch, um, posture, are we leaning into that conversation? Are we appearing interested in wanting to interact with this person? Or are we sitting there behind our computer typing and igno really ignoring those interactions, that positive interaction? We also need to read the posture of the individual that they're giving us. Yes, their facial expressions, yes. Just remember that all behavior has meaning. When communication fails, try distraction. You can change the activity, come back to it. There's nothing so important um, that needs to be taken care of at this time, whether it's toileting or bathing or feeding, doesn't matter. Um, uh, communicate in other ways than just words. Remember that nonverbal communication is really important. And watch your own behavior, right? If you feel tension building up within you, give yourself a break. And so, you know, hopefully I gave you some, some uh, strategies that you learned something maybe a little bit new. Um, you identified perhaps some barriers within yourself that, that um, you can begin to make some changes or at least in your staff members, for those of you who work in that. Uh, and maybe developing a plan to educate yourself. And I know this was really short, 45 minutes. Just contact me if you have any, any questions. Enjoy the rest of your day.